This is going to be the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And the book of Genesis is an amazing book. It's one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. In the book of Genesis, God tells us how everything began. And Moses is the writer of the book, and he wrote it around 1700 to 1500 B.C. Uh, the first chapter tells us some incredible things about God, so that's going to be the theme of of this chapter. At number one, we see the first thing about God is that He is before the beginning. Daniel 7 9 calls Him the Ancient of Days. And remember when you were young and you thought your grandparents were ancient and you couldn't fathom a time when they weren't in existence? That isn't true for them, but it is true for God. He is ancient. You can't think of a time when he wasn't around or wasn't in existence because he has always been here and always will be. But if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. For God to be here in the beginning to create the heaven and the earth, he had to be here before the beginning. The fact that God has always been here is something we can't wrap our heads around. What was God doing a gazillion years ago? God lives in eternity outside of time. He was living even before a gazillion years ago. Picture the life you know it from the beginning of time until the end of time. Picture that on a DVD or a videotape or a chart. Uh, God is outside of that DVD or chart or whatever you're using to track time. And he can rewind it or fast forward it or pause it. He can look down on all of it at once or he can put someone forward in time. He can take someone back in time. As he did the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, he put him forward in time. Uh, God knows the ending from the beginning. It's memorized in his head. He's not going to forget it. Revelation 22:13 says I am alpha and omega the beginning and the end the first and the last. Hebrews 1:8 says but unto the son he saith thy throne O God is forever and ever. So in Hebrews 1:8 God calls the son God. Even God the Father believes that the son Jesus Christ is God. He says the throne is forever and ever. It's always been and always will be. God's always been in charge. He's always been here. So God is out there in eternity. And Second Peter 3, 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Genesis 1 may seem like a long time ago, but it really isn't a long time for God. If there are 6,000 years from Adam and Eve until today, that is only six days to God. So God is before the beginning. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The first verse he writes in his book is nothing short of incredible. Atheism and evolution are both debunked in the first verse of the Bible. When it says, in the beginning, God... It reveals that there is a God. So right from the get-go, it goes against atheism. And the fact that it says God created the heaven and the earth shows that God is the one who has always been here and that matter is something that is created and that it isn't eternal. The fact that it says God and not God's, God singular and not God's plural, that debunks polytheism. The belief that there's more than one God. There's only one God and he's in three. So God was here before the beginning. And his enemies, atheists, evolutionists, and whoever else that deny him, they are unprepared because they fight him through denying his existence. People like Bill Maher and all these atheists who are continuously fighting something that they don't even believe is real. They're fighting him through denying his existence. So they're unprepared. They're not worried about salvation. They're not worried about 
a rapture that's coming that's going to leave them here on the earth to face the tribulation. They're not worried about the second coming. They're fighting something that they don't believe is real. They're fighting it by denying its existence and they're going to lose because they're unprepared. Psalms 53, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Jesus Christ is coming back one day and he's coming to take over. His enemies deny his existence and they have no fear of God before their eyes. They couldn't be any more unprepared. You need to prepare to meet thy God. God never missed out on anything. God always knew everything. So nothing ever occurred to God. He already knew it. He has always had all wisdom and all power. Uh, men get wiser as they get older, but even though God never ceases to exist, He still has the same amount of wisdom as He's always had because He has always had all wisdom. Uh, God can't improve because He has nothing to improve on. Uh, put together everyone's life who ever existed, and God's life exceeds those years. And there was never a time when God didn't exist. He was before the beginning. One day when we get a glorified body, we will be able to understand how this is possible. But right now we can't. We just have to accept it by faith. But not only is God before the beginning, He is also creator of creation. So He's before the beginning and He's the creator of creation. And these atheists and God deniers will use their breath to cuss the God who created the air that they're breathing. God himself created the heaven and the earth. Nehemiah 9.6 says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. And the book of Colossians lets us know that Jesus Christ created everything. Jesus Christ is eternal. He is part of the Godhead and He has always been here. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Jesus Christ is the creator of all creation. Hebrews 1.2 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus Christ is God, and he is the creator. He's the creator of all creation. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The Word in those verses is none other than Jesus Christ Himself, and everything was made by Him, as the Bible says. He was before the beginning. He is the Creator of creation. Psalms 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. So Paul tells us to work with our hands. If you want to be like God, you need to work with your hands. The firmament showeth His handiwork. You don't know how much work God did on the creation other than what he tells us. But all the work that we have done put together could never amount to the work God has done for us. And he did it effortlessly. God did some heavy lifting when he slung the stars and sun into the second heaven. Although it wasn't heavy lifting for him. It's amazing to know and see what God created with his hands. Look up at night and see the stars, see the clouds and the trees and the mountains. Smell what he created. You can hear it. He created what you can see and smell and hear his creation with. The creation isn't God, but the creation shows you that there has to be a God. Romans one twenty says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You're without excuse if you deny God. You see Him in all creation. Isaiah 45, 18 says, He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 says, In the beginning, 
God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now if he created it not in vain and formed it to be inhabited, then why does verse 2 say, And the earth was without form and void? It seems there could be a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, a period of time that's separating the two verses, a period of time that's not mentioned here in the first two verses. But the scriptures point to a catastrophe which could have taken place during that time. And during this gap, you have a time where Lucifer, Lucifer could have fallen. But that is an entire different study in itself. Maybe something to do a study on yourself on a rainy day. But let's look at how Genesis describes the creation. On day one, God said, let there be light. Genesis 1, 3 through 5 says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God is in control of something as powerful and as fast as light. He himself is faster than the speed of light. He created something as fast as light. So he has to be faster than what he created. And that is how he can move men forward and backward through time. As he does the Apostle John in Revelation. But what about day two? On this day he creates a firmament and divides the waters from the waters. Genesis 1, 6 through 8 says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So the firmament is called heaven. And this firmament is what people call outer space. Uh, where the sun and the moon and the stars are. And we know this from verse 14 in Genesis chapter 1. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and then and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So this firmament is called heaven and it's where the sun, moon, and stars are. So this shows us that Heaven isn't just the place where God is. There's more than one heaven in the Bible. There's actually three heavens. But this firmament, firmament is the second heaven, or what people call outer space, and it is separating two bodies of water. So there has to be water above space if this firmament is separating two bodies of water. And that is exactly what the Bible teaches. In Psalms 148 and verse 4, it says, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Now, if you say this to the average person, they're going to say you're crazy, but that's because they've not read the Bible and anything that sounds a little extreme or supernatural or far-fetched, they think it should be on a sci-fi fantasy movie. But notice the word heavens is plural in Psalms 148.4. And the Bible talks about more than one heaven. The first heaven would be where the birds fly above your head. The second heaven is where the sun and stars are. And the third heaven is where God is. So if Psalms 148.4 says there is water above the heavens, plural, not just heaven, we know there has to be a body of water above at least two of them, which would be the first and second heaven. So the firmament that God created separated the waters on the earth from the waters above the second heaven, which is directly under the third heaven. And John refers to this body of water in the book of Revelation and calls it a sea of glass in Revelation 4, 6. In Job 38, 30, it says the face of the deep is frozen. And David says he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. You know why God calls soul winners fishers of men? Because the souls are under water. There is a giant body of water way above your head, light years out there. So this firmament separated from separated the waters from the waters. 
And God most likely used that great deep above your head to drown out the original world, a world where Lucifer reigned, a pre-human earth, where no humans were. I don't believe there were humans before Adam, but that's a completely different study. And so on day two, God created the firmament. Now let's see what he created on day three. In Genesis 1, 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So this would be the waters under the first heaven, the sea. Notice that when he gathers together the water unto one place, the dry land appears as if it were already there. And that's something interesting. Genesis 1.10 says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And that's the sea that you can see here on earth. And have you ever thought about this? When you go against God, you're going against the person who named and created the planet that you're walking on. In Genesis 1.10 it says, And God called the dry land earth. God's the one that named the planet that you're walking on. Genesis 1.11 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So God brings forth the grass on the earth at this time as well. And the easiest color for man to look at with his eyes is green. And when you look outside, most of what you're going to see is green. Uh, Genesis 1.12 says, And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Notice the continual phrase, after his kind, all throughout this chapter, and that goes completely against evolution. Genesis 1.13 says, And the evening and the morning were the third day. That phrase, and the evening and the morning, is also significant. Notice the first mention of a third day is a complete three days. Okay, now, day four. Day four is where God makes the sun, moon, and the stars. And people are still fascinated with the sun, moon, and stars to this very day. NASA spends millions or billions of dollars to try and figure out something that God created thousands of years ago something that God knows everything about. Imagine the understanding God has of all of these things that man refers to as the unknown. Uh, men are writing books called The Unknown and writing things about the unknown, which aren't unknown to God. He already knows it all. Uh, he knows the deep and secret things. He knows what is out there and he knows what is in the water. Uh, man hasn't discovered all that's in the water, but God knows every hidden buried treasure, every type of animal that's still alive in the waters. Uh, Genesis 1.14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So this is the purpose of the lights in the firmament. They are for signs, seasons, for days and years. They aren't for people to worship, and they aren't to be inhabited. Genesis 1.15 says, And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Christians should do the same thing. The same way God is using these lights in the firmament to give light upon the earth, we should meditate and study the Bible to be a light in the earth. God uses men who have been taught by the Holy Spirit to shed light on the scriptures. And Genesis 1.16 says, And God made true great lights the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So the greater, greater light would be the sun, and the lesser light would be the moon, and he made the stars also. And Genesis one seventeen says, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Notice that this is an effortless act. It says he set them in the firmament. And something funny is that we have a God who is strong enough to set the stars and whatever else in the firmament. And yet people worship false gods who they have to set up on a shelf or nail into a wall. 
in First Samuel 5, 3, when God knocks Dagon, the fish god, on his face on the floor, his worshipers have to set him back up. We have a God who can set the stars and the planets up in space, yet there's people who worship a God who they physically have to set up on a shelf. Genesis 1.18 and 19 says, And to rule over the day and over the night, and to, to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Notice God continually divides light from darkness. He doesn't want them mixed. He doesn't want them confused. He doesn't want us calling evil good or good evil. He doesn't want us calling ourselves women if we are men. He doesn't want calling want women calling themselves men. Um, now let's look at day 5 in Genesis one twenty. It says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Notice that water is connected with life. You need water to live. When you were born the first time, it was a water birth. Your mother's water broke. And Jesus talks about receiving the living water. When you believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, then you take the living water and you never thirst again. So God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. So water's connected to life. And he used it to bring life to the fish and to the fowl, which is the birds. And Genesis one twenty one says, And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God is careful to show a difference between the fish and the whales. He knows his creation better than anyone else. Genesis one twenty two says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the animals did exactly what God said, and they haven't stopped doing what God said. They are still being fruitful and multiplying. And notice he says the word fill, and not replenish. There was life on earth before Adam, but it wasn't water creatures. That is why it says, Fill, and not replenish. If you believe in that gap in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, then you know that something was living on earth before Adam and Eve got here. It wasn't humans. It was Lucifer and other beings that weren't humans, obviously. But like I said, that's another study. But on day five, you have water life and birds. But now on to day six of creation. In Genesis one twenty four, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. The cattle would be like the pigs, the sheep, and the goats. The creeping thing would be like the lizards, beetles, and locusts. The beasts of the earth would be like bears and tigers and lions. And Genesis one twenty five says, And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Once again, God uses the phrase, after his kind. And the lions aren't turning into something else. The monkeys aren't turning into humans. Lions beget lions, and bears beget bears. Humans make more humans. Now finally, we come to the creation of man. Genesis one twenty six says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God gives the animals to man, and the animals do not have as much rights as humans have. Animals aren't equal to us, and God could care less about animal rights like the people today do. If an animal is attacking someone, it's okay for you to shoot the animal and not have any worry about it whatsoever. If you're hungry, then kill an animal and eat it. God wants you to. It is an unnatural affection for a woman to be more concerned with a puppy that's in a hot car than she is about a baby that's in a hot car. Any type of teaching that says animals are as important as humans is over the devil and it's unnatural. Genesis one twenty seven says, So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Notice that Adam was made in the image of God. He didn't have to get born again as we do today. He was already in God's image. Luke 3.38 calls Adam the son of God. But we today don't become sons of God until we get born again. This is because when Adam sins in Genesis 3, he loses the image of God and takes on a sin nature. And this sin nature passes down all the way through to us today. And the only way to get our soul clean from sin is to believe the gospel by putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But moving on to Genesis 1.28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Stop and think about this. The animals could have been larger at this time, and there could have been animals that were much larger than the ones on earth now, and have since gone extinct. And Adam had dominion, over all of them. There was no animal superior to Adam. Adam didn't come from animals. Uh, he didn't come from a monkey. There was no evolution involved anywhere. And notice God tells Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. The word replenish means like to refill. So if there hadn't been some inhabitants in the earth before Adam, why does he say replenish the earth? Now, I don't believe in a pre-Adamic human race, but I believe it is a possibility that Lucifer and other beings inhabited earth before Adam, and this would have been where Lucifer fell. Genesis one twenty nine says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is, upon of, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree-yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Meat in the Bible can mean any kind of food that you put in your mouth. It's just not ta it's not only referring to like meat as in steak. Uh, Genesis one thirty and thirty one says unto every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God can see his entire creation at once. Imagine having a snowball with a little city inside and you can pick it up and look down and see everything in it. And it is like that for God and his creation, except he sees it even clearer than that. So we have seen that God is before the creation, before the beginning. We've seen that God is creator of creation. And he is also defeater of darkness. I hope defeater is a word. But it went along with what I've got going on here. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The word darkness is some of is one of the most interesting words in the entire Bible. It is connected with sin, with judgment, and pretty much anything negative in the Bible. It is, is another clue for me that points to a catastrophe which could have taken place between the first two verses in the Bible. But God always defeats the forces of darkness. And when they took, took Jesus to be crucified, he said, This is your hour and the power of darkness. And Satan is the power of darkness. Jesus Christ was victorious over this power when he died on the cross. In Colossians two fourteen and 15, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He triumphed over the powers of darkness. He defeated the devil in the garden when he fasted 40 days being tempted and he is going to defeat him at the second advent and at the battle of Cog and Magog after the millennium and then Satan will be defeated again when he's cast into the lake of fire. Jesus Christ made it possible for us to defeat the darkness when he shed his blood for us and we can now become children of light because when you get born again, the light lives in you. 
Genesis 1, 2 and 1, 3 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Where it says, And God said, that's the word of God, Jesus Christ. Just as the Holy Spirit moved on the waters, He can also move on you during your time of darkness. When you're depressed, when you're lonely, suicidal, panicking, or suffering, you can talk to God and He's there during your time of darkness. All three persons of the Godhead are present with you and living in you if you're saved. Just like all three persons of the Godhead are present in the first three verses of the Bible. Look at them again, Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God. There you have the Father. And the earth, earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's the Holy Spirit. And in verse 3 it says, And God said, There's Jesus Christ. He's the Word of God. God said, that's God's words. All three persons of the Godhead are present with you during your time of darkness. If you're a born-again Christian, then your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You have the God who made the worlds living in you. Notice that the earth is without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then the Holy Spirit showed up. Just like you, before salvation, inside you were void, which is empty and vacant. And the only thing you had inside was the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in all the children of disobedience. And then after salvation, the Holy Spirit moved in, and you were no longer without form and void, but rather you were a new creature. And if you're saved, then you have been delivered from the power of darkness. Colossians 1, 12 through 13 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You are no longer a child of hell, a child of the devil, or a child of darkness, because God delivered you from the power of darkness, and you are now a child of light. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 says, Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. But God is before the beginning. He is creator of creation. And he defeated the darkness. He is also a legend of light. And you hear a lot about people talking about being legendary today. All the athletes want to become a legend. They're chasing the ghost of Michael Jordan, as they say. But God is the only true legend, and he is connected with light throughout the scriptures. Even his weapons are full of light. In Habakkuk 3.11, it says, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. At the second advent, he is going to slay all the God-haters with a sharp two-edged sword. And the two-edged sword is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my fat path. God is a defeat, defeats the darkness, and he is the legend of light. He slays darkness with light. And Genesis 1-3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. All God has to do is say something, and it comes to pass. God is light and has power over light that would blind you if you came across it in your natural body. Uh, Genesis 1-4-5 through 5 says, And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Notice in the middle of this is the Hebrew method of reckoning time. It says the evening and the morning were the first day, and the Hebrew day goes from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the day starts in the evening. And you can see this in verses like Psalms 55, 17, where it says, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So that's the Hebrew method of reckoning time. And notice light shows up before the sun shows up. This is light from God himself. God divided the light from the darkness. He is a divider. He tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. He tells us to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You are a child of light, so he wants you to separate 
from the darkness of this world. He wants you to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. As it says in Ephesians 5.11, he says in John 12.46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. We need to abide in Christ who is the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. So God is the opposite of darkness. 1 John 1 5 says this, Then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He is the defeater of darkness and the legend of light. And in that gap we've referred to a few times between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, there was a catastrophe. This caused darkness to be on the face of the deep. Before this, there was Nothing separating God from his creation. He was the one giving light to it. Like the way he will in the future in Revelation 22, 5. It says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. But this has been Genesis chapter 1.